within our economy, both from the perspective of policy development, as well as implementation in the business arena. Cass, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Ms. Yoliswa Makasi, Director General of the Department of Public Administration, is an enthusiastic, self-motivated activist who has held this post since March of this year. Uh, previously, Yoliswa was the Chief Executive of the Film and Publication Board uh, with key competencies in public policy, risk management and governance very important for today's discussion, strategic and biz business planning, project management, stakeholder relations, coaching and employee communications. She has also served in myriad roles uh, within the public service uh, from operations to management and a political at political strategic levels. Mr. David Lewis is the, uh, welcome, excuse me, to you, Yoli. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. David Lewis is the executive director of Corruption Watch. He chaired the competition tribunal for a decade from its founding at the end of uh, the, in 1999, uh, receiving his training in economics uh, from various universities in South Africa. Uh, he is also a well understood and well known hand in governance uh, in South Africa in terms of keeping an eye on the public purse as well as how it is applied. Um, he has been he has had conferred upon him uh, a doctorate, an honorary doctorate in economic sciences from the University of Cape Town. David, thanks so much for joining us. In the name of housekeeping, we're obviously looking forward to a robust discussion of great relevance to all of us while these esteemed guests are on the panel. But so I would really like to invite you because I'm sure many of you have burning questions and comments to contribute. Please feel free to send us your questions in the chat box at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Without further ado, let's dive right into the discussion. When asked to describe Oliver Tambo, many people use the words courage or courageous and ethical. The two traits are mutually exclusive. And yet, as with during the apartheid era, in order to be ethical, one must to an extent show courage. Do you feel in this, in, that in order to be a truly great leader in this critical time of, of awkward leadership around the world, uh, one requires both courage and ethics? And if so, how does this translate into South Africa's, into today's South Africa? Yoli, I will, I will afford you the ladies' uh, start on that question. <laughs> wow. Well, um, good morning, or is it good day? Good day to all my panelists, and, um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be part of this panel today. I think it's, it's, it's a very important panel, and the topic itself is quite important. You've asked um, a question about um, um, how relevant is um, um, courage and, 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 and ethical leadership today in South Africa. And I was just um, perusing my notes earlier on, and I was looking at one study that was done by the Public Service Commission. And this study was done in 2018, and they were looking at uh, what are some of the key ethical issues um, that we're facing with, uh, we are faced with in the public service uh, in South Africa. And they did a survey with all um, uh, public servants at management level, and a number of issues came out, which I think that still uh, are issues that we have to look at today. Uh, uh, Rufilo, let me apologize, my video is not working. I'm not sure what's happening. It's, uh, That's it's not okay, we do see your up, picture, at least. Oh yeah, hence I've put the picture. And uh, the public servants who were surveyed across the country uh, raised a number of issues. And I'll just want to highlight those issues just to show you a picture of what are some of the issues we're dealing with in the public service. They raised concerns around inconsistency in the application of rules and discipline in the public service. They raised issue around abuse of time, e.g. late coming absenteeism. They raised an issue around victim victimization of employees who differ with managers incompetence, unqualified people being appointed, people being at work, but not working, doing their own things, abuse of resources for personal matters, no consequences for unethical behavior, abuse of cadre, develop, uh, cadre deployment, which means inappropriate political interference in appointments, jobs given to family members and friends, and political interference. These are the top 10 unethical behavior occurrences that we identified by public servants in 2018. And uh, certainly, if you look at these issues, um, uh, you would realize that I think later on, maybe when we deal in detail about 
the, the, the definitions around ethical leadership, you would realize that indeed in the public service, we need ethical leaders um, uh, because the issues that we have to deal with are issues that require character, that require integrity, and the issue around courage, because courage is about um, a virtue, which is behavior showing high moral standard, is about you know, not being deterred by danger or pain or, or fear when you deal with such matters. So certainly in the public mm -hmm. service, we at leadership levels, at different levels of responsibility in leadership, you need to have that courage to be able um, uh, to deal with some of these issues that are raised here. Mm -hmm. The question is how do we build that courage? How do we support um, uh, uh, colleagues or public servants and public service leaders to build that courage and to build ethical leadership and ensure that our environment embraces an ethical climate as well. But I would like to uh, maybe uh, engage later, a little bit later on those particular areas. Thank you, Rafilo. All right, thank you so much, Ioli. So there's an acknowledgement there that there's a dearth of, of ethics in, in large part, according to that report in 2018. And yes, one cannot really engage that without some form of uh, ethical intervention as well as the courage to do so. David, what are your thoughts with respect to uh, whether or not these two traits can be um, mutually exclusive? Are they absolutely required in this environment? Well, you know, when I got the invitation from you, I took purposefully long in responding to it and I hope you'd find somebody else to deal with these kind of complex, complex terms that we all use every day, but we don't really, think a lot about the meaning of. You know, so I took the unusual step and ponderous step of looking in the dictionary at what these words mean. And, and ethics means, um, according to the dictionary, moral principles that guide conduct. And courageous means not deterred by danger or pain. And I, I would put it to you that I don't think that those are the principal qualities of leadership. Um, you know, morality is a very difficult thing. You know, uh, one person's morality is another person's immorality. You know, in, in political parties, loyalty, for example, is prized above all, generally. And it, you might find yourself in some ethically very compromised positions, backing your, your, your leader out of your sense of loyalty, which is the moral principle that guides you, when in fact, of course, your, your, your respect for your leader and your respect for your party indeed should never be unconditional. There should always be limits to that loyalty. You know, courageous is defined in the, in the, in the dictionary as not deterred by danger or pay. Well, you could equally define reckless as not deterred by danger or pay. I'm not sure that I would like a leader who is undeterred by danger of, of pay, or pain. So these are, these, are, these are difficult concepts. And so what I'll, I'll do is I'll give you my one and only anecdote about Oliver, Oliver Tambo, which impressed upon me a different quality from either courageous or ethical, although he might have been both of those as well. It was an occasion in 1986 when, when Oliver Tambo was awarded, was, was delivered the first Olive Palm Memorial Lecture at the Riverside Church in, in, uh, in New York. And um, there were a, a full church, a full, full audience, and the procession had already come in. Oliver Tambo, Jesse Jackson, um, David Dinkins, they'd all come in and they were all on the stage. And the only person who was not on the stage was the person who was meant to be introducing Oliver Tambo. And a couple of minutes later, we heard the clack clack of helicopter rotor blades as they landed on the lawn outside. And into the hall came sweeping Alan Bussack, who proceeded to the stage and delivered a sort of American Baptist-like speech and for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then went sweeping off the stage. And you heard the helicopter departing, and there was Oliver Tambo about to make his speech. And one of the things that Alan Bussack described Oliver Tambo as was the longest serving leader of the oldest liberation movement in Africa. And Tambo began his speech by saying, I'm off in a, in, in a very sort of quiet way, I'm often referred to, and I'm often introduced as the oldest leader, the longest serving leader of the oldest liberation movement in Africa. 
but isn't that an indication of my personal failure and the failure of my of my of the liberation movement that I lead and I thought god I wish that there were more leaders who could ask that question about themselves and their organization in in public and it just contrasted me for me two styles of leadership the one that was in I have to say, encouraged by bombast and ego, and the other one that I think was um, characterized by humility. And I think that that's the essential trait, the trait to be able to take criticism, to be able to question yourself, to be able to question your organization, to be able to disagree with comrades and people in your own organization. And it impressed upon me that that was the... Um, that was the, the quality above all that, that Oliver Tambo seemed to me on that occasion to, to possess and what I feel must have made him a great leader. So the quality of self-reflection, one might even say, yeah. um, and, um, and, and, uh, and, self, and introspection is quite an important one. Mm. I, think, I think that's a fantastic addition. Thank you very much, David. To you, Cass, what are your thoughts about the balance between um, morals, obviously at least ethics, uh, and courage in this particular case? Well, it's, it's very difficult coming in after David and his dictionary <laughs> definition of ethics and courage. So I'm going to veer away from the dictionary definition as such. I, I, I think that we need to look at those two qualities, and I think, I think that those are both essential qualities. Within, the, within particular contexts. And, and, and I think that one needs to look at it within the context we are in in South Africa currently and have been for the last few years. So, you know, it is common cause, uh, both uh, as a result of, of some of the recent uh, uh, legal action that have been, taken place uh, also because we know what uh, corruption and, and illegality and bad practice in both government and business has cost this country, both financially and uh, socially. Uh, and, and within that context, I think that one has to uh, have won the courage and, and it's not necessarily just a pain to yourself, but the courage to say that this is wrong, irrespective of what the institutional structure you belong to says about it. I think in our current context, we need to relook really at, in my view, the relationship between a member of a political party and that political party. I think we need to relook at uh, how the political parties are actually structured and whether they give their members sufficient space to actually uh, express their own ethical and ethical views and have the courage to actually back those up and act uh, according to their views uh, without recrimination from the party itself. Now, these are very uh, idealistic views, I guess, but I think that's what's needed. And, and I think that in a situation where we have both a social and an economic crisis in our country, mm -hmm. and where hard choices need to be made by people who are who purport to be in leadership, both in business and in, and in government, I think it does necessitate courage because in making those hard choices, you are going to actually have to uh, stare certain people down. Uh, you are going to have to uh, uh, challenge your own, uh, in my case, my own organization, a business organization, in the case of somebody in, in politics, their own political organization or their own structures in government in, at some points. And I think that takes courage. And, and, and all of that has to be driven by sound ethics, uh, 
sound belief in what is right and sound belief in making choices that actually have a positive impact on the broader socioeconomy in this country. And, and so I think the two go, do go hand in hand and I think you need both to actually uh, rise above the flay and show true leadership qualities in the current context. Thanks for that. I mean, I think those are really great um, starting points for all of us uh, to hear your perspectives from the different positions you hold in, in, in society. You know, David, I, I, I only seek to, to perhaps considering to challenge your, your perspective, I want to add to it rather, or at least I'd like to bring you onto the side of, of taking, taking on the, the ethics and the courage, because I think Cass's point about looking at this in context is very important insofar as all three of you have indicated the pressures of organizational gathering. And that doesn't necessarily need to be a political party, but the list of issues that Yoli gave us, the abuse of time, victimization, um, no consequences, inconsistency of discipline are all uh, demonstrative of a, of a culture within an organization. And this can also be reflected in business. I'm sure you're, you're we're all aware and, and, and we know about the, um, the group speak and the group mindset of institutions that have just gotten used to doing things a particular way. And in that regard, I feel uh, from, a con from, a, from a contextual perspective, it is exactly in this time that that courage um, and ethics is required for the self-reflection, David, that you that you mentioned, right? To be able to speak yeah. out about it. Yeah. I want to set the scene a little bit more tightly. Um, you know, all of us have had our eyes glued to the state capture, the, the Commission of Inquiry on State Capture. And it has demonstrated to us that there seem to have been a number of quite a few ethical people who have been able to come forward, but did not have the latitude to, to express their courage up until this particular point. Um, maybe in that context, Yoli, you know, you can help us understand some of the challenges that you wanted to dive into a little bit more deeply um, and maybe using examples that be, you know, very similar to what we're already seeing at the state capture inquiry um, with respect to how CADA deployment uh, in victimization and incompetence have actually played out as against uh, the, the motivation or the intent of courage and ethics. Well, I mean, look, Lucila, I think that, um, David raised um, quite an interesting issue, firstly, around um, 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 recklessness uh, could also be uh, associated with courage and et cetera. What I like about this topic is how you have linked courage and, and, and ethical leadership together, because I speak about uh, courage in context to ethical leadership in context to this conversation. So because in terms of ethical leadership, we know that it's always about doing the right thing and doing for the good. So, so that context is quite important in, 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 in this subject. Just on some of the examples that I raised earlier on, yes, I mean, we've all been watching uh, the State Capture Com uh, Commission or uh, Justice Zondo Commission, let me mention it correctly. And there's a number of issues that have come out of it. And I think each one of us in the public serv service have to do our own self-introspection and self-reflection. We've all, I think we've all, at least those in, in leadership positions in the public service, we've all had our own experiences of how um, at certain times you had to choose the good over the bad or you had to choose the bad over the good. So people can reflect on a number of uh, personal experiences uh, around that particular issue. But um, there is, in the public service, there is laws, there's systems in place, there's institutions in place, but we have people and people being people sometimes, or in most instances, it depends on what cases we are dealing with, decide not to follow the processes, decide not to uphold the requirements that are there. I think in terms of the institutional mechanisms in place and governance processes, a lot has been done in policies, but we, we have to work with our people and assist and support to ensure that uh, there is this alignment, there is this um, understanding of a higher reason and a bigger cause why you are serving. It's not just for the self, but for serving, for serving the communities, which is 
which lies at the core of the ethos of public administration. So my own observation is that um, also, I think that we have had a lot of obsession in the public service with compliance and there's nothing wrong specifically with compliance. So we have all these templates, all these forms and all these things that we do. But if you think about the, um, uh, the constitutional principles um, and, and the constitutional values for public administration, how do we carry these values, values of efficiency, transparency, justice, fairness, and et cetera, they are there in the constitution. How do we carry them in our day-to-day -day responsibilities and in the delivery of services that we have to do in the public service? So I have a, a view um, a receiver that says, and I, I haven't done any decisive study to prove this, but I've been reading a lot about this matter that we need to bring values at the center of running the public service. So we need a values-driven public service because in that way, we are also going to assist our own people. If we change the culture, we work our people to change the culture to that of accountability, taking responsibility and learning. We are going to assist our people to self-regulate. We are going to assist our people to learn and to understand what is right and what needs to be done in the interest of the people. So it must not just be good for me as an individual because I'm not in the public service to serve myself, but it must be in the good of the community. It must be in the good of the people because I'm in the public service to serve. So I think that there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot that has been done, uh, but we are still stuck a lot in a compliance driven mode and we need to move swiftly into bringing values to the center of how we do our work. And we need to leave values in the public service on a day to day basis and that the type of conversations that we have, the type of an environment that we create uh, um, uh, as we do our work in the public service, those things matter a lot. Thank you. I think you are muted. Yes, I get. Sorry, I, I we don't have we don't have unmuting powers. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for unmuting me. Okay, I understood. I think uh, I think those points are fair. You know, there's a great deal of focus in South Africa on the public service and what it owes to taxpayers. But in the same fashion, private sector uh, companies have an owing to the environment and to the um, ecosystem in which they operate. Cas, as the as the CEO of of, of uh, Business Unit South Africa, is there enough focus on the role that public, private sector plays and the need for their ethics and um, and courage? Insofar as there are the corrupted, but they are also they are the corruptors. Is there enough focus? I don't know. I guess there needs to be more focus so long as we have corrupt and illegal and unethical practice, we need to increase focus all the time. Uh, so so I guess I guess there's room for to increase focus on this. But also I think that if we look at the last few years, uh, if you look at the previous administration, I think business within the context of business being a fairly conservative sector, generally, business became quite active in, in uh, uh, acting and in fighting and in supporting uh, activities uh, that were mobilized to fight state capture at that time. Uh, so, so, you know, I remember numerous occasions, uh, I was still at the Banking Association at that time and Mike Brown and Sipo Pichana and others marching in Pretoria, speaking at future uh, South Africa events uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, I think at the time when um, uh, uh, Pre Minister Gordon was made uh, Minister of Finance again after uh, 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 he was kicked out uh, after Minister Nene was kicked out and we had uh, Minister Van Royen for a couple of days, uh, business mobilized quite substantially to assist in fighting state capture to assist in trying to 
uh, address and to try and try and use business infrastructure to track some of the funds and so on. So I think that they there has been quite a lot of activity and business became active. But having said that, I think that business organizations need to call businesses out if businesses are involved in corrupt activity. And, and when we saw during the KPMG time, the Bain consultancy time, the McKinsey time, uh, those were members of Business Leadership South Africa and Business Leadership South Africa suspended those memberships. Uh, we, we developed an ethical code of good practice. Uh, so, so I think there is a lot being done in business. I think uh, the, the seminar that David was talking about was some work that Corruption Watch and others did on, on looking at disclosure of corruption and anti-corruption activities in, in corporates. And, and I think those are absolutely necessary and we need to keep businesses uh, feet to the fire to consistently uh, disclose what they're doing on corruption to consistently ensure that they are putting into place mechanisms and systems and practices that limit corruption in their in their activities. And, and as we point one finger at, at government, we have to point one finger at business as well because it takes two to tango in this case. Sure. So Cass, I mean, we tend to, today we happen to be focusing quite a bit on corruption, but I think uh, the leadership, and I quite like this question that came through from Brenda Kubeko, thank you for your question, saying should we not define ethical leadership as responsible leadership? Um, there's a great, uh, there's a long arc of responsibility that comes long before corruption. Um, as a critical creator, co-creator of the financial sector charter, for example, um, do you feel that, and, and within business in general, part of the responsibility that business is supposed to have is to allow the economic participation of previously disenfranchised people. How do we hold them accountable to doing the right thing, being responsible, being courageous uh, in the face of fighting, you know, um, shareholders that may be resistant and being ethical about helping us right the wrongs of the past in this way? Yeah, so, so you know, things like the um, black economic empowerment legislation, the various codes and so on, do go some way towards uh, beginning to get businesses to look at inclusion and look at transformation and so on. But I'm convinced that, again, it's organizations like BUSA, like others, you know, I've always taken the view that the role of organizations or business organization is to push the envelope, mm -hmm. is, to, is to challenge their members to do business differently, is to challenge their members to actually look at the context in which they are doing business and, and take that into account. And so I think that if we can begin to have a mindset that says that repurposing our economy post COVID, for instance. If we repurpose that economy and it's the same economy that we've had all these years, that's not as inclusive as it should be, that's not as transformative as it should be. It just does not make business sense, okay? So I've always felt that, and I've, I've said this in public, that if you have an economy where the majority of the people in this country are not part of that economy in different forms, be it as workers, be it as entrepreneurs, be it as owners of businesses, be it as shareholders, if they are not part of the economic growth and the economy that we actually repurpose, then in the long term, businesses do not do business. Correct. You know, and I've, I've always said, whenever I speak in Santon, for instance, where, and I say, so this is reputed to be the richest square mile in Africa. Well, a mile from there is one of the poorest townships in the country, okay? And, and who am I to stand in judgment how somebody in Alex, who doesn't know where the next plate of food for his or her child is gonna come from, reacts? Okay. So if businesses continue to operate, if businesses in Santon 
continue to operate without seeing what role they can play in improving the condition of living in Alex and including those people in economic growth, then they won't be doing business in the long term. Mm -hmm. And so it's got to become a business imperative. It's got to become a hard business mm -hmm. imperative mm -hmm. rather than, and I'm, there's not, there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in CSI, but very often these things become a CSI activity. It must become part of your core business activity because it's good for business. And I think yeah. that's what we should be doing. Indeed, not about the altruism, but really about the logic of it all. David, let me let, hear from you on this one. Um, I wanna turn our attention to civil society um, who you represent very well through Corruption Watch and the like. You know, did you, is you, what is your sense of the moral fabric of South Africa and as much as we, we're trying not to get too tricky about our discussion. But I want to use this uh, quote from retired Colonel uh, Patrick Sweeney, who indicates, uh, quote, therefore a leader's moral courage provides the force of will to do what is right, regardless of the situation and the costs the leader must incur in combat. This is critical because leaders' moral courage and integrity define the moral and ethical boundaries that subordinates must operate within. Has having a firm moral code or firm moral uh, fabric become too expensive for us subordinates in civil society? I don't think it's become too expensive, but I, I think that, you know, opportunistic decisions are taken um, that, that achieve a small victory or maybe even a large victory. And um, moral principles are often bent in the process of, 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 of getting there. You know, which is why I tend to look to leaders like, like our own iconic leaders, uh, uh, Tambo and, and Mandela, more somehow than I look to kind of Mother Teresa and, you know, even, even a figure like Gandhi, you know, I think to be involved in the, in the real world, um, battling it out with adversaries who have different interests to yours, different languages, different histories, different backgrounds, and not come to some compromise, some decision that somebody is going to be able to say, you compromised your moral principles at this point is well nigh impossible. And you just have to, I suppose, you know, as I said earlier, be self-reflective. Uh, look at whether it was worth the compromise that you that you made in the in the end, whether the compromise hadn't taken you further away from your goals than the achievement of the mm -hmm. of the actual um, victory. You know, when I think about our, our own country, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I find, I find very distressing. I mean, you know, we, we tell ourselves that we're a country that is characterized by Ubuntu. And I, I find the, the opposite of the, of the truth, quite honestly. You just have to drive down Jan Smuts Avenue and know that if you don't let the guy through the red light, screaming down the road as you try to turn across the road. He's probably going to get killed and you're certainly going to get killed. But he relies upon your, um, what can it be, lack of courage, if you like, not to exercise your right to cross the road at the time when you're entitled to do so. And you can see it in, in so much of our, of our personal interactions with each other. And you know, one question that I would really like to traverse in the in the course of this um, of this really interesting uh, workshop that you've seminar that you've organised is when a country is no longer characterised by Ubuntu. I mean, we work a lot with um, with uh, uh, immigrants. Mm. Tell us that they've never been to a country where people are this unkind to them. And they've been generally, by the time they've got here, they've been to many, many poorer countries mm -hmm. where people's kindness comes at a much greater personal price. So what is it about this country? Um, uh, you know, you can think of things in our history that have twisted all of us and distorted all of us. Um, 
But how do we get from being a country that doesn't have, have Ubuntu to one that does? You know, and this really mm -hmm. confounds me, you know. Um, and it's something that I think that we should really speak about because we're actually talking about fundamental behavior change on a society-wide level. And I, it frustrates me that I, I have no idea about how to, how to bring that about. And in the end, it's brought about by your leadership. So, you know, for 10 years, we've come through a, a, a leadership that was morally corrupt and bereft of any dignity or courage at all. And so instead of standing up to the leadership, for a long time, we kind of enjoyed it. Some people enjoyed it. Some people who felt cut out by the Mbeki regime enjoyed the, 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 the leadership of the Zuma regime until he, they saw that he wasn't on their side either. Um, and I think it is down to leadership. And, you know, what I, as I say, what struck me about Oliver Tambo, and this was my only association with him, was his humility, which is not a quality you find often in leadership. Mm. Mandela is not somebody whose humility would have always struck you, but whose ability to, to, to face up to his followers and say to them, you are wrong. You know, this is not the right path. We're going on this path. And those who want to follow me, follow me. Those who don't, well, that's it. And I, so, I found that took that, that takes an enormous amount of courage. I mean, I remember on a on a on a you know the completely other end of the courage spectrum. You know, I remember when when you know I spent the first twenty years of my working life in the union movement. When you had to go back to uh, hundreds of workers and say the strike has been lost, or we can't get the wages we. We, we thought we could get for you. I mean, that, the, that I always felt took more courage than often than I had. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's your ability to lead, not to follow when you're a leader and use the excuse that that was the resolution or that wasn't the resolution. But your ability to say, look, we made a mistake there. Let's change, let's change direction. And obviously the courage of the follower is to be able to say it back to the leader, not, but we've already decided that, but to say, we think that's, we think that's wrong and we're not following you on this, on this, uh, on this point. So, I, I, you know, a lot of this confuses me, but I don't think that our country in some is doing well on the, on the, on the social capital front, on the Ubuntu front. And we can look for that, not necessarily in big ways, but we can look for it in the way we drive, the way we speak to each other, the way we treat the guy who's, who's, who's begging at the, at the traffic lights. These are the small tests that I think we South Africans fail every, every, single, every single day and use excuses. In and David, I think in that case, we, we definitely agree. I mean, this is, this is the moral fabric I'm talking about, is has it frayed somewhat in the environment of poor leadership? Um, I've got, we've got a watcher asking us, you know, good afternoon, um, will we ever get back to the place where we all, will have ethical and courageous leaders? Will we ever come out of the cloud left by the likes of Jay-Z? Um, as ever, South Africans have a, a great ease, I suppose, in pointing out the likes of a Jacob Zuma, great ease in pointing out, as you rightly say, let's not deify leaders. Uh, we must understand the trade-offs that need to be made, um, but we'll happily not pay their TV license. <laughs> as, yeah. as they applaud your corruption watch findings, they will happily um, try to bribe a cop. They will happily, um, you know, uh, avoid a lot of the require, requirements of good citizenship. So perhaps this conversation about courage and ethics needs to come down a notch into the 58 million and not just at those who we see up ahead. Um, Yoli, I'd love to invite you at this point. I mean, you've been a participant in creating a great deal of uh, governance policy, but what David is talking about is a form of self-governance. Um, and again, we we're highlighting that self-reflection. Would you like to give your comments on the, maybe the frustrations of uh, trying to lead in an economy or in a society uh, that isn't quite playing ball with the expectations they have of the public sector themselves? 
I think, you know, um, uh, um, uh, Rafila, South Africa is, a, is an interesting society. Exactly the, what, what, what is an individual as a member of society, I expect from others that I see who are in power, um, seemingly, I don't think that should apply to me too. So, so this is the dilemma that we have uh, in our country that we, we also, our, our, our lens of view of leadership is very positional. So it's about somebody who is in a position in an institution somewhere. But if you think about leadership as a way of life, as a philosophy, um, it, leadership is, 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 is about us, it's about people, it's about the processes and the things that we do, how we engage and et cetera. So if you, if, you, if you take that concept of leadership and, and, and think about it as a way of life, everybody is a leader, but in everybody being a leader, we have different responsibilities. Um, the lady in the office who is a cleaner, the lady uh, or the guy in the office who is a, who is a, who is a security guard, those, those people come from households, those people come from societies, they are leaders, they run families, they run households, even in the place of work, they, you may just be occupying that particular position at work, but beyond that position, you have your own responsibility. And even in that position, you have leadership responsibilities attached to it. They may not be as high level as those of a CEO because of the nature of the bureaucracy itself. So I think how we engage with the concept of leadership, we, it's, we, 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 as the 58 million people in South Africa, we struggle to take responsibility because the day each one of us take responsibility for our action. And um, it starts with taking that responsibility, that reflection. I mean, there's lots of work in leadership development around, done around the importance of self-reflection, the importance of reflective practice, if you think about coaching and et cetera. It right. starts with us doing that reflection and being able to say, how can I do better? What have I done that I, does not sit well with me or it does not sit comfortably with me and take that level of accountability to the next level. And I do think that it's a challenge that we have as a society. And remember your institutions like the private sector, government and et cetera, those are institutions of society. Uh, so if the society is behaving in a certain manner, you, if you have members of communities who are willing to bribe or police officers as an example, you will, not, you will have police officers who are a reflection of that. And I'm not justifying police officers taking bribes. I'm just showing the interface between institutions of governance and society at large. So it's important to always keep that, that, that thinking in mind and, and to keep that, that, that link in mind. You know, I don't, I, I, in my life, I, I, I try not to focus on frustrations because I, I, I believe in not being negative in my approach, in being positive. So in every situation, I try and find something positive that I can learn or that I can build around. I do think that in the public service, there's a lot that has been done and there's a lot that is being done to try and clean up, to try and build capacity um, of officials, of leaders to do things differently and et cetera. I do think that it's gonna take some time and interventions are happening at different levels. There is interventions that are happening at the level of education. I mean, you would have seen, for instance, the National School of Governance is doing lots of works around ethics leadership, around professionalization of the public service and et cetera. We also have to look at motivational dimensions. What motivates public servants, for instance, to be in public service? Mm. The ethos of public service is about serving. Are they there because they are serving? Yes, we know that people need money to pay the bills and et cetera, but what is that connection there that is there? And we need to build on it and we need to work on it. And um, so there is all those kind of interventions that are taking place. And I think we need to build on them and we need to hold each other accountable in like in other areas of society as well. So, so let's, let's continue to do that. Let's continue to hold on another accountable. Thank you very much for that perspective. Uh, I guess what I'm getting from you also is that it's kind of, it's almost vocational. Um, it, should be, it should be vocational what you're doing within the public service, even if of course one is happy to, to earn from it. Um, can I ask you to um, please elaborate a little bit more just also in, in, um, in the name of Andrew Mokatla's question here saying, what are, our, what are our institutions other than the State Capture Commission doing to help change the status quo? 
Um, you've touched on education, you've touched on the motivational dimensions, but won't you just help us understand with a little bit more detail those other interventions at different levels that you referred to? Well, I mean, I think that you would have seen um, there's a lot of work that is being done around um, one of the areas, for instance, that we work uh, in, in, the, in, in, in DPSA, just around discipline management in the public service. One of the challenges that we have is that we have lots of cases of suspensions of people and dis discipline management that take forever to be resolved. And we've, um, one of the things that we are doing currently is just to look in that space and see what are the interventions that we need to do working with the departments and working with provinces to deal with those matters. If you think about this concept of a values driven public service, we're talking about professionalization of the public service. Uh, mm. Cabinet has done some work on it. I mean, we've done some work, we've taken it to cabinet, it's back from cabinet, it's time for implementation. We've got approval on certain things that we need uh, to be doing as part of professionalizing the public service. The, the one issue around, um, we, we are all looking with anticipation what comes out of the state capture from a perspective of corruption. But one of the things we do, we also look at cases involving public servants. There's lots of public servants who are implicated in cases on PPE, uh, corruption related matters, on other matters that are being investigated by your SIUs and HOCs. One of the things we do in my department is we look at those cases involving public servants because we have to ensure Maybe that- Just go into your room, sweetie. Because we have to ensure that they are, take, they are taken up to the last end of the process. So we get the database from the investigating authorities and we check with, our, with the different government departments that they've raised disciplinary cases against the people in, in, in implicated and so that those who have to be assisted to exit the public service will, will exit the public service. What we have observed is that when you deal with the challenges of corruption, yes, law enforcement have their own role, but it's usually reactive. The mm. act has happened already by the time the law enforcement steps in. It's important to also focus on prevention. So there's lots of efforts uh, uh, that work around how do we prevent corruption in the public service? How do we strengthen our systems further? Um, uh, there's, there's new responsibilities that have been given to the Auditor General as well in terms of investigations and holding officials and leadership in the public service accountable for whatever remedies that they don't implement as, as recommended by the AG. So I do think that there's a lot it's just that the organization is big and it's going to take longer um, um, perhaps to transform and to change some of these issues, but we can't get tired. We have to work with our partners in civil society to continue to push. Okay. Um, we're having, a, uh, I, I thank you for those concrete examples. We're having a, a, a largely esoteric discussion about the changing of a, a, a social construct and moral um, code of a country. Uh, that is starving. Cass, do we have time to become the people that David and Yoli is describing, to be professionalized um, as the financial clock is ticking? COVID-19 has hurriedly brought us to the brink of where we were probably heading in about three or four years. We're looking at anemic growth going forward. We are no longer at investment grade. There are, there's very little room for mistakes. Um, and we need to still be able to deliver as corporates, as well as, um, as civil society and government uh, to one another in very extraordinarily challenging times. How, how do we carry out the full gambit of ethics in this environment? Yeah, so, so look, we, we don't have the time. I, I, I think that we, we can't, address all the issues we need to address simultaneously in, in my view. I think the bottom line is that we have a socioeconomic and fiscal crisis in this country, the, or the most severe socioeconomic and fiscal mm -hmm. crisis since the advent of democracy. Yeah. Uh, we had that crisis before COVID, we were in recession. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, we were downgraded to junk status. Since then, we've been downgraded further. Uh, we have a severe fiscal crisis in that we are not 
collecting enough revenue to meet the expenditure we, we, we have currently. We are not growing businesses. We are not developing businesses. Uh, and when we go out into the market to raise funding, we're gonna feel the impact of the downgrades. So, so some hard decisions need to be taken right now to, to put our country onto an economic growth path uh, in an inclusive way so that we develop SMEs, we look at new business growth, we, we look at skilling our people to actually participate in what is becoming a digital economy. And we need to do all of those things now. Uh, and, and, you know, we can have all sorts of ideological debates about the type of economy we want to build this on, which is fine. But the reality is that we operate in a global economy of a particular form. We've got to try and work in that economy and, and, and within that context, build our own economy in a way that is inclusive. So we think some hard decisions need to be taken immediately. We think uh, some things are implementable immediately that will actually instill confidence, mm -hmm. but those levers lie with government currently. Uh, we, we obviously engaged in a lot of negotiation and discussions with social partners on this. But the bottom line is that, you know, I go, I'm going to David, where David talks about Ubuntu and so on. We, the, bot, the bottom line is we've lost our values as a society mm. across the board. Somehow we've lost those values and we need to find those values again. But at the same time, we need to take some hard decision that does bring about economic growth. And, and the way we build our economy after taking those hard decisions need to be informed by the values we've lost and we need to, to find yeah. again. But I mean, and of course this will, if you rightly say, this will require the trade-offs that David was saying, we can't have deified leadership. We've got to, we've got to make some, some calls here and there. I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it back to you, David. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, carry on. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll take it back to you, David, uh, just to suggest, uh, I'm, I'm allowing your definition to be the challenge to me, uh, or your mm. uh, unpacking of the definition. We mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that you know courage and ethics were something that we needed all the way back in, in our early history in the apartheid days. And in many respects, ethics and co courage meant defiance. Mm. Um, and we're seeing a rise of that. Protest is becoming the 12th official language in South Africa. Mm. The burning of trucks, uh, the destruction of materials are bringing a great deal of attention uh, to, or are, I, sub, I should probably say they are a, uh, they are a symptom of this very uh, time, clicking, ticking time bomb that Cass has just described. Um, and in the meantime, while we're, we're trying to raise money with uh, fund, fundraising with, with no investment grade, we've got this emergency that's, that's coming up with, with individuals and society, members of society who would argue that they themselves, excuse me, would argue that they themselves are um, are ethical and justified in, in much of their action. How do we address this right away? Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, because, you know, very often the people who are committing sometimes atrocious acts that endanger the lives of others, sometimes their own comrades. Uh, sometimes people who are just absolutely innocent passers by. Um, uh, how, and their answer is nobody listens to me otherwise, you know? Yeah. They're asked for an explanation. And, and so, you know, who can, you know, easily take the moral high ground and blame people whose, whose only recourse is. is what is objectively wanton destruction, you know? We, our offices in Bramfontein, when I see the workers coming down from the hill on a strike, which happens with regularity, and tipping over those, uh, those concrete uh, dustbins and trashing, trashing the place. Mm. My first thought 
is, wouldn't it make more impact if you went and trashed Santon rather than <laughs> Bromfordy, where you could actually oh, get some, an answer from somebody, you know? Um, but I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know the answer to Cass's um, uh, solution that we need to find our values again. You know, that's what I tried to, to pose at the beginning of uh, a little while ago in the conversation is how do you help society find commonly held, well, you, what you would like to think are commonly held values again when they seem to have, have, uh, have lost them? Uh, it's, it's a real conundrum, you know, we, we, we did it in the case of, of, of AIDS and the condomized campaign. And because we were the transport workers union, we were talking to transport workers about condomizing long before it became a, a, a conventional wisdom. And boy, they didn't like it. They didn't like it. But that was an easier campaign because it concerned really one action. Yeah. One yeah, action. Yeah, so when you came on today, but um, I'm happy to turn my video off. Sorry, um, that person needs to mute themselves. And, um, and, and finding values is a, is a very difficult thing. And, you know, it's clearly as difficult amongst, maybe even more difficult for powerful business leaders than it is for ordinary employees or powerful politicians than it is for ordinary citizens. Um, Boy, and, and, and let, let me tell you, once you've lost your values, you have lost something very big and something that is very, very difficult to bring back again. I was reading an article in the, in the New York Times the other day about my, my, the company that I love most to hate, which, mm. is, which, is, which is McKinsey. And we <laughs> dealt with them here and what they did yeah. here. They also worked for a company, this big article said, for a company called Purdue Pharmaceuticals, which is the company that made untold fortunes out yes. of the painkiller OxyContin. And they were hired by the company firstly to deal with the mothers of dead teenagers and to get them out of the way. And secondly, and, 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 and secondly the, 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 the article spoke of a proposal that they had made that, that Purdue Pharmaceuticals pay the big retail pharmaceuticals distributors, a $14,000 rebate for mm. every one of their customers who died of OxyContin. Now, you know, when you've reached those depths, how do you expect this to be, um, um, uh, how do you expect the, this company to find any values if ever it, if ever it had them, other than by refusing to deal, to deal with them? or going to break the windows of their offices. You know, and that's what the, the vicious circle that leads to, to, um, to all of this. But you, know, you, know, you may be coming to this review where, but one thing that I, I found, I, I'm surprised that we've gotten an hour into our conversation without a mention of the churches. And, um, and you know, what about them? Because again, I recall, I'm sorry, I'm doing a lot of, I, I, I recall stuff today. When I, I, you know, I, I recall when, when, um, when I was in the unions and, and because we were a transport workers union, our, our members were very, you know, how do you term it? Very unsophisticated. They were mostly rural people, rural dock workers, rural railway workers. And there's some incredibly fantastic leaders out of all of those. I mean, really extraordinary leaders. I mean, people who are often illiterate, but who really commanded the respect of their, their fellow uh, workers. And they were almost to a person, also leaders in their churches. Mm. And it never made me think that, um, that uh, all church people are good people, but it did make me think that all good people are church people. And I, I, I wonder where that force has somehow dissipated to, because it doesn't seem very strong at the moment. And I think if we are talking about long-term behavior change, which is my preoccupation, we need the participation of those kinds of institutions. Indeed. I mean, um, a religious leaders and social um, board was pulled together earlier in the year to try and sort of revive our sense of um, 
obligation to one another, although it was mostly raised in, in and the president pulled it together mostly in the name of, um, mostly in the name of responding to our behavioral shifts uh, with respect to COVID, trying to get people to get on the moral mm -hmm. bus of uh, staying home and the like. Um, I was so surprised when you said churches, David, because in my mind, I had the Bushiri types in my mind and I was thinking, <laughs> where is he taking us? But I think unfortunately that it's, it's possible that for believers that the charismatic and slightly less um, upstanding churches seem to have possibly uh, taken up a great deal of that space. But you raise an important point, which the president mentions almost in every speech, which is the notion of a social compact. Mm. Um, and yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a great notion and it's a great buzzword for him to use. But as you three of you sit here, representing different parts of our economy and different parts of our society, I'm sure you know that we are all um, burdened with competing interests. You know, Yoli is, is talking to us about the importance of professionalizing government, but it's the same public servants who are, who are pushing for this increase in wages that may take us even further to the brink. Uh, there, there sometimes are some con con competing um, interests, for example, businesses that will say profit is the only thing that matters and um, inclusion of people who are black or people who are brown or women uh, might not be a meritocratous way uh, for us to serve our shareholders. So it's kind of an important moment for us to step back now to say from an ethical, non-deified and courageous space, how do you think each of the areas that you represent um, can come to the center of the table with respect to that, com that social compact. And I'm gonna use an American example to, to frame this. So Business Roundtable is a collection of a number of Fortune 500 companies, the CEOs thereof, who have in 2018 um, replaced the notion of companies exist to drive shareholder value in that Friedman-esque way, and actually expanded it to speak about stakeholders, the environment, our customers, our employees, um, you know, as well as the business's growth. Something along the lines of what Cass, you were mentioning about making sure that it's a, it's a good idea for us to make sure uh, that everything in the country, everybody's uh, competing interests are looked after. So um, I'd like to give it to each of you to just give us a sense of how, how does your part of society, oh my goodness, um, if someone can turn off that screen, um, how does your part of society, <laughs> You see, David, now we've, we've got pornographic images coming through. I <laughs> know. Did you see that? Hey. I, I didn't. <laughs> we were talking about Mario. Oh, oh, boy. Okay. Yes. Um, so how, how do you, let me start with you, Yoli. Uh, how does your part of society meet us in the middle with respect to that social compact that the president speaks to us about, particularly from the perspective of uh, you know, this, this form of leadership that we'd like to take as a society? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> You're a big brain. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I was actually fascinated by the conversation that led to this question around, um, I think, the conversation on what is to be done. Yes. And um, I almost have the feeling that it's like we are giving up. And I, I just want to say we can't give up because we need, uh, we need to keep this country for future generations. They must find it intact. And, um, and I do think that values are also about champions. And I think that in our families, in our institutions, we have people who are championing these things every day, but we just need to give them more volume. We need to give them more support and we need to listen to them more on top of other sophisticated things that we can do. But uh, let's identify these people in our communities, in our spaces, and let's give them more space, more volume and more uh, capability to talk and to engage and to build this capacity. So I don't want uh, to give up. And I acknowledge that values are really about deeply held views of individuals and, um, and, and, but it is a social construct and therefore values can be learned and unlearned. Good values can be learned and bad values can be unlearned. And I think we must, we must do interventions uh, across society that um, uh, look at, 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 at how, we, how we can 
um, um, teach good values, how we can learn good values and how we can um, unlearn bad values. In terms of social construct, I mean, um, uh, social compacts, I think that uh, it's a popular language in South Africa and my experience where I sit around social compacting is that uh, it needs the maturity of yeah. all parties involved. Um, so all parties involved must be matured, must be responsible and must understand the bigger picture. So if any of the parties involved in a social con compacting process do not understand the bigger picture, then you are likely to have challenges. You also have to be transparent as partners uh, so that each one knows what's happening on the other side. And, um, and um, uh, so it's, uh, it's still one of the ways we could work around, bring together the different partners in the different spaces. And I think NetLake is one of those uh, institutions, organizations that really have shown us over years how social uh, compacting can work and how relations and partnerships between government, civil society, uh, labor and, 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 and the private sector to some extent can be, can be harnessed for the better good. And I think we should build on those and we should uh, give more effort around those. Uh, my, I think my, my, my last comment on these issues would be that in my environment, I, I do think that we need to do a lot of things. To, um, uh, 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 we need to up the ant a little bit. And um, I think that the more, the more good people we have uh, who are out there and who are showing their goodness regarding the actions that they're doing, the more others are going to learn. And the more we have those bad people being taken out of the system through the legitimate processes that have been built into the person into the system so that the others who are intending to do bad can also learn it's also very important so the prevention part and the reaction part uh, and the reactive part must complement each other thank you thank you Cass. how does business and society um meet us in the middle in the social compact i think about things like resisting minimum wages uh you know and things like that how, how do you feel that they can they can meet us in the middle for all of these uh, outcomes i think Cass has been muted if our host can unmute him please okay social compacting is undoubtedly a mechanism and a tool that we should be using but i think that we need to meet as social partners to actually one we just need to have the sort of discussions that enable us to try and get onto the same page at least to understand what the problems are mm. uh, and i'm not too sure we're doing that currently and and you know social compacts don't just come from the ether. They need to be built, they need to be developed. Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize that between the various social partners, we come from very different mm -hmm. places, essentially. Right. Uh, and that informs some of the views mm -hmm. we have. But I think that if we look at social partnership as one as, as stakeholders getting together to try and just get onto the same page to understand what the issues are and what we want to achieve as a country. And then to, to look at where the trade-offs need to be made to actually get to where we want to achieve. But I also think that, that social compacts and, and, and engagements in social compacts should not replace the expectation we have and the mandate we've given to government to govern. Often what we look for is consensus among stakeholders on every issue before any decisions are taken. And we can't have that. So we need to look at social compacting as a good mechanism mm -hmm. for social partners to put issues on the table, to try to reach agreement where we can but I think we need to give ourselves a period of time to do that, after which government needs to go back and say, okay, what we've agreed on, this is what we're doing. What we haven't agreed on, well, as the government of this country in the national interest, this is what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And business might not like everything of what government decides, but that's fine. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Others might not like, but we need some sort of certainty and decision making after processes of social compacting. Okay. David, I'll let you sweep. <laughs> how, how do we get to that center, that social compact? Um, you know, I've been, I've been very struck by the president's support for social compacts. It seems to me that he wants this to be the legacy of his presidency. And I can think of few um, sort of higher minded uh, legacies and, and more effective ways of governing, taking with Cass, in the end, decisions belong, many of the decisions uh, uh, that, that the social compact would make would, uh, would reside ultimately with, uh, with government. And, you know, I, I find that the president is, is, is better at articulating the, the, the benefits of a social compact than he is at taking the necessary decisions right. um, to, to make it go forward. Um, you know, NEDLAC was an incredible innovation for a while, and then it, it really lost a lot of its standing as people started to become friendly with each other and jump into bed with each other, and the unions would be talking to the bosses independently of NEDLAC and government and the and the and the and the uh, business would be speaking independently of, of one another, and it it lost its uh, it lost its power. And I hope that under the president, it can under under this president that it can regain its uh, its status. Um, how do you get there? You know, I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you you know one very concrete example from a long time ago that I think our president could exploit quite easily. You know when. During the New Deal, when Roosevelt came in in the, in the 30s and, and the, the New Deal was introduced, he had as much opposition from his own party as our own president does from his own party. Mm. And what he did was that he, 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 he embarked on something called the fireside chats, where every, every week he would speak to the nation Mm -hmm. And the nation would be encouraged to write to him and tell him what they thought of what he said. And the next week he would answer them. And I think that that's what we want. You ask what civil society wants. We want to be listened to. We want to be, we want to be heard. We do have some unique perspectives and some unique uh, uh, entrees to, to the South African people. And we want to be listened to. And we want to be listened to on our on our on our own terms. And I think that our president could do much to bring that about. He has the kind of personable style and 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 empathy mm. I, I, that I discern that would make him follow that Roosevelt example very very um, successfully. And I think that he should do that. You know, one of in in in. Corruption Watch's work, one of the most frustrating things has been trying to work with, um, with business. And mm. through my competition days, I got to know a lot of people in the business community and a lot of leaders in the, in the business community. And I want to say to them, you know, we, we are fighting here a problem, and I'm talking about the corruption problem for the time being. We're here fighting a problem that none of us can solve on our own. Mm. Government can't solve it, business can't solve it, and certainly civil society can't solve it. This is a whole of society problem. And we better all get together and say, take this off the political agenda. Let's all get together and, and fight this, uh, this scourge. And, and uh, the appeal to business has not been that we think exactly the same. The appeal to business has always been that we don't think exactly the same. We don't look the same. We don't mm. get paid same we don't dress the same our language is difficult the books we read tend to be uh, 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 different and the powerful impact of us getting together is precisely that we are not the same we are not natural allies but we are all getting together to fight a common problem and that statement should be enough to make people sit up and 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 listen um, instead I find often a lot of problems, even with my own colleagues, in, in treating business as a legitimate interest in the country. You know, yeah. some, 
crazy, but that's true. And how do you work with somebody whose legitimate existence you've denied, you know? Right. Um, and, and those are, I, I guess, the, the things to say, but it's to listen and it's to be heard and it's to have voice. Um, that, uh, that takes the long time, that takes a lengthy period of time in social compacting, because you've got to get a, over a lot of baggage before you get there. But mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's worth the candle. And I think it, it would be wonderful if that did in fact become uh, uh, President Ramaphosa's legacy, that he had revived social compacting in this country. And it doesn't have to be done at a national scale, at a NEDLAC scale. You know, I could think of a social compact in the health sector that would solve most of our problems in the health sector. Bring together health workers, uh, private sector companies, regulators, and the citizenry. And you can get it, we could get over a lot of our health problems. And similarly in other sectors of the society. I can't think of a better metaphor than uh, that in terms of uh taking that social compact forward. In other words, uh, that way you say, um, we are so different, our goals are so different, and it's precisely that difference that brings us, that brings us to this table uh, to find something that works, that's workable for all of us. I love the, um, the analogy of the fireside chat, and I hope um, our president is, or anyone who's close to him is listening at this particular time. I think he's a president who tells us much. We get his, we get his, uh, weekly letter and we get his announcements, but I don't know if he hears us much. We don't get to question him at his press conferences and we, there doesn't seem to be a feedback loop the way that you just described in the fireside chat. So that would be lovely to see. And I think what I would definitely take away from this uh, discussion uh, is definitely that the urgency of the issue financially, societally, uh, and morally definitely is enough incentive for us to get together at the table. And you quite rightly say, uh, not just at places like Nedlag, but where more of society can see it. Because what we are seeing, particularly with opportunistic political players at the extremes, is the um, exploitation of our frustrations uh, in, in, and uh, the, the pulling apart. And I think this is a, also increases the urgency of our needing to come together and undo and close the trust deficit that South Africans seem to have coming from various parties, be they racial, business, organizational, and the like. Um, all to say, the social compact itself is the ethics. Uh, but as you said, we can't just articulate it. The courage is in the doing. And so I will close out to say the ethics as well as the courage are both needed in order for us to individually lead as the 58 million here in this country. And I'd love to thank you so much for being so open, all three of our guests uh, today. Yoli Swa Makasi, thank you so much, Yoli, for your uh, pr uh, profound contributions. Kaskuvadia, very much appreciate your perspectives as well. And David Lewis, um, I especially appreciate the journey you've taken us on and many of your anecdotes into our history as well. Thank you to everybody uh, who has been uh, with us this afternoon. I have a few minutes uh, left. If somebody did have a burning question that they wanted to send uh, in, in the chat box. Otherwise, uh, without further ado, I would happily hand over uh, to Ms. Ngyagi Petros, the general manager of ABSA's group corporate relations to close out our event. Thank you. Thank you, Rufilwe. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We've come to the end of a thought-provoking discussion. Before we wind up, let me take this opportunity to convey a few words of appreciation. On behalf of the APSA Group and the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, I wish to express sincere gratitude to all the panelists who were on this webinar today this has been an inspiring conversation on a matter that is so central to our well being and success as a society. The shortage of ethical leadership is at the core of our problems as a country. Today's discussion has once more brought home the fact that our collective success depends on selfless, courageous, and ethical leadership. 
So thank you to the panelists for tackling this complex and very important topic. While we may not be able to solve our leadership challenges in a day uh, or during a webinar, it is important that we have these conversations in public platforms as often as possible so that these lessons can yet again take root in all of us. To the audience, thank you for choosing to be with us. We hope that you enjoyed this discussion and that you will find it valuable in your own leadership journeys. To the Oliver and Edley Tambo Foundation, thank you for your commitment to ensuring that these kinds of conversations do take place. Thank you, Zeng, and your team, Natasha, Noloazi, and Buccello. I wish to also thank my colleague, Viwe Tlaliane, for being the glue in our relationship with the Tambo Foundation. I would also like to thank you, Refilwe, for providing such a good steer on this topic. Once again, sincere thanks to everybody and goodbye. Thank you.